Okay, thank you for that. And uh, and Dr. Brian, your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think he's spot on there. And it, really, the problem is the inflammation and the the plaque instability and plaque rupture that occurs in a, in acute MI. So even in patients who have overt coronary disease, if you can stabilize the plaque, then you know these patients can be stable and free of events uh, for a number of years. And you know, as Dr. Montgomery says, as a cardiologist, you see patients with less than 10% stenosis that have a you know acute MI. So it's not the degree of stenosis of the coronary disease, it's the vulnerability of the plaque. Yep. And so if and nitric oxide is what stabilizes that, downregulates the adhesion molecules, prevents the platelets from aggregating, and really stops the inflammatory uh, cascade that leads to plaque rupture and acute MI. So I think when we look at, and going back to the original question, yeah, there, there are many phytonutrients in, in vegetables, the antioxidants. What we focus on is the inorganic nitrate. And the interesting thing in the combination or the, the symbiosis with the oral microbiome is humans don't have this enzyme to metabolize nitrate. This is only dependent upon, these are only bacterial enzymes. So what we're finding, we published on this about 10 years ago, that people who use mouthwash basically destroy the oral microbiome and no longer get the cardioprotective benefits of a plant-based diet. And I've had conversations with Caldwell Esselstein and you know Joel Kahn, a lot of these plant-based cardiologist and, you know, every, every physician sees patients that, you know, they can't explain, right? You put them on this regimen, some people respond, some people don't. And so now we're starting to query their patients, you know, do you use mouthwash? Are you doing, are you destroying the oral microbiome that's disrupting the nitric oxide effects of a plant-based diet? And two out of three Americans use mouthwash every day. And two out of three Americans have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's not coincidental, it's causal. So we, as, as Dr. Montgomery said, we have to we have to support the microbiome. You know, we don't take an antibiotic every day for the rest of our life because of the destruction it does on the gut microbiome. We cannot use an oral antiseptic every day because of the destruction it does on the oral microbiome. So can you explain? So oh, I'm ahead. sorry. I, I just wanted. I, I like the comment Dr. Brian made about the the uh, the the mouthwash because if we think about bad food as being the only thing, but there are many other things we put in our system that affects the microbiome. That's a great example of one. And, and I also want to highlight the point, excellent point he made about the 10% lesion being the one that can cause a heart attack. And I, I think that's something that really needs to be um, uh, um, highlighted to the audience, largely because um, patients would go see the cardiology and you get a coronary angiogram. And you get a coronary angiogram and say, well, we don't have any, we, don't, we see minimal or no, or the coronaries look, they may say the coronaries look normal. <laughs> and they may discount some irregularities in those unstable plaque. And I, I can tell you from my clinical experience, I've, I remember a patient, and, and it's not just one, but one that comes to mind immediately, uh, had a myocardial infarction in the middle of the night. I got up, rushed to the, to the emergency room, took him to the cath lab. He had classic EKG changes from myocardial infarction, classic symptoms, tombstone. I got the caffeine, injected the coronaries, and saw nothing. And the reason I saw nothing, because he had like a, a maybe a 5%, 10% plaque that ruptured. It thrombosed. It shut off the artery. By the time I took a look, the thrombosis was already dissolved by the body's mm -hmm. internal thrombolytic system. And so the only thing was left was the insignificant plaque that would have been ignored had it been had undergone a coronary angiogram. And so we often do these coronary angiograms and tell the patient, well, your coronaries look normal, et cetera. And they can have small vessel disease, et cetera. Uh, but I think it needs to be emphasized that uh, the coronary angiogram, we used to call it the gold standard of, of the test, and it's not the gold standard. That's number one. Number two, uh, the unstable plaque is important to understand is infrequently is the one that's not 90% or 95%. And number three, the vessels that we tend to treat with PCI and bypass are the 95% vessels, which in many cases are more stable than the ones that we don't see and we don't treat. If you put a stent in there, you're increasing the, the uh, inflammation within the cardiovascular system, which predisposes to those unstable plaques that you don't see of rupturing. So it's one of those things, and, and that's why we look at the, the, the five-year date on bypass surgery, and we look at the PCI data, and it shows no benefit over medicine alone, is because what we're treating is not the vessel that's likely to cause a heart attack, and we may be doing something that predisposed to the, the, the lesion that we don't see or we ignore to rupture sometime in the future. Yeah, thank you. 
So Dr. Brian, can you explain the whole nitric oxide pathway from eating, you know, leafy greens or, or whatever vegetables that you suggest that we eat, how it breaks down in the mouth and, and why mouthwash would be bad. Yeah. And then also would mouthwash with, without alcohol be a problem, right? I'm assuming it's the alcohol that that's killing all of the bacteria in the mouth. Yeah. So we've done a number of studies. So anything that's antiseptic, whether it's chemical antiseptic like chlorhexidine or alcohol based mouthwash, they all do the same thing. They, they kill bacteria indiscriminately, the good guys and the bad pathogenic bacteria. <clears throat> so the pathway that we discovered probably 25 years ago in the diet. So when we eat, for instance, spinach or kale or, or green leafy vegetables, 90 minutes after we consume that meal, the nitrate is specifically taken up in the duodenum, which is the proximal gut. And then there's a pathway where that nitrate is taken to our salivary glands. And then that nitrate is taken up to a silent receptor in the salivary gland. So now every time we salivate 90 minutes after we consume that plant-based meal, then our, our salivary glands are secreting nitrate. And then the bacteria that live on the crypts of the tongue in the their facultative anaerobe, so they perform this two electron reduction of nitrate to nitrite. And then when we swallow our saliva for the next six, eight, 10 hours, as long as we have sufficient stomach acid production, we get acid disproportionation of nitrite into nitric oxide and you get a burst of nitric oxide gas in the lumen of the stomach. And so this pathway is dependent upon three things. Number one, you gotta get enough nitrate from your diet. Number two, you must have the right oral microbiome. And number three, you must have sufficient stomach acid production. And the standard American diet and the standard American lifestyle basically eliminates all three of those. Number one, we don't get enough nitrate from the diet. Uh, number two, two out of three Americans are using mouthwash. The other problem that I failed to mention is fluoride in toothpaste. Fluoride is an antiseptic. 99, probably most of the toothpaste out there are fluorinated. Fluoride is an uh, antiseptic. It's a, it's a neurotoxin and it shuts down your thyroid function. So we have to get rid of fluoride in our toothpaste. You have to get rid of fluoride in your drinking water and just avoid it. It's one of the most toxic substances on the periodic table. And then number three is antacids. You know, there's 200 million prescriptions written for antacids every year, and that's not even counting the the over-the-counter Prilosec, Prevacid, Nexium. Uh, so without stomach acid, these drugs completely shut down nitric oxide production. And there were data that came out in 2015 at Houston Methodist showing that people who had been on PPIs for three to five years had a 40% higher incidence of heart attack and stroke. And that can be explained by the complete abolition of nitric oxide production. And then just in December, a report came out showing that a 40% higher incidence of Alzheimer's, rapid onset of Alzheimer's is seen in patients taking in acids. So number one, we have to get people off in acids. You have to get people off of uh, fluoride toothpaste and antiseptic mouthwash. And we've got to develop a dietary pattern where you get sufficient nitrate from the diet. And we published on this in 2015 because the question was, well, you know, for, for docs like Dr. Montgomery that want to prescribe their patients certain dietary patterns. Well, doc, how much broccoli do I need? How much spinach? How much celery would I need to eat to get 300 to 400 milligrams of nitrate to manage my blood pressure? And we did a, a cross or a, a survey around, we went to New York, Raleigh, Chicago, Dallas, and Los Angeles, five cities all across the U.S. We brought it back to the lab. We analyzed it for many nutrients, but primarily nitrate. And what we found was there was an 80-fold difference in the amount of nitrate found in celery, broccoli, spinach, and compared Dallas to New York or Chicago to Los Angeles. So there are regional differences in agronomy and plant nutrients and the amount of nitrate that's found in these vegetables. So it's almost impossible to prescribe, you know, three to five servings of any vegetable because there's regional differences. There's a wide variation in the nitrate in the vegetables. And there's, there's a huge difference between conventionally grown and organically grown. You know, organic is good because they're not exposed to herbicides or pesticides, but to get an organic label in the U.S., you can't add nitrogen-based fertilizers to the soil. Without nitrogen in the soil, you cannot assimilate this into nitrate and, and feed the, the nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the soil. So organically grown vegetables have on average about eight to 10 times less nitrate than conventionally grown. So organic, and you know, if you just look kind of historically, since the 1940s, there's a 78% decline in micronutrients in the food grown in America. So it's not just nitrate, it's, it's other micronutrients, and it's because of farming practices, it's, 
it's uh, insufficient crop rotation. It's in the, the, the pressures of feeding a growing planet are at the expense of nutrient density in the foods we eat. Thank you for that. So um, Sally Norton uh, is the author of a, a book called Toxic Superfoods. And I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with her work or not, but she uh, talks about uh, oxalates um, that mm -hmm. disrupt cellular function by interfering with essential minerals like calcium, magnesium, and impacting cellular communication and overall health. What What are your thoughts on on that? Like, I'll throw it to you. Well, I think there's 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 patients that are more susceptible to oxalic acid or oxalates that you know can lead to kidney stones and gallstones and things like that. But you know, it's individual susceptibilities. But certainly, plant based uh, diets are are typically higher in oxalates. And if you've got patients that are susceptible to them and uh, 